हेलो एवरीबॉडी अस्सलाम वालेकुम आई एम मोहम्मद साहिम रफीक फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फिजिक्स यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ गुजरात पाकिस्तान आई एम हियर टू डिलीवर अ शॉर्ट वीडियो लेक्चर अंडर द काइंड सुपरविजन ऑफ बर्थी डॉक्टर अब्दुल माजिद डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ फिजिक्स यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ गुजरात पाकिस्तान आवर मेन फोकस थ्रू आउट दिस प्रेजेंटेशन विल बी ऑन लैंडो रियर प्रिंसिपल एंड इंफॉर्मेशन थियरी now we discuss the concept of information and its intimate relationship with physics after an introduction of all necessary quantum mechanical and information theoretical concept we analyze landor's principle that states that the area of information is inevitably occupied by the generation of heat we employ this principle to redrive a number of results in classical and quantum information theory this demonstrates the usefulness of landor's principle and provides an introduction to the physical theory of information now we we'll discuss about equation of landor's principle landor's principle says that there is a minimum possible amount of energy required to raise one bit of information known as landor limit here landor equation kt log 2 k is the boltzmann constant value is equal to 1.38 tensor ki power 23 joule per kelvin t is the temperature in kelvin log 2 is the natural logarithm value is equal to 0.69315 and our principle is a physical principle pertaining to the lower theoretical limit of energy consumption of computation It holds that any logically irreversible manipulation of information, such as the erasure of a bit or the merging of two computation paths, must be accompanied by a corresponding entropy increase in non-information bearing degrees of freedom of the information processing apparatus or its environment. Another way of phrasing Landauer's principle is that if an observer loses information about a physical system, the observer loses the ability to extract work from that system. If no information is erased, computation may in principle be achieved which is thermodynamically reversible and require no release of heat. This has led to considerable interest in the study of reversible computing. At 20 degrees Celsius room temperature or 293.15K, the Landauer limit represents an energy of approximately 0.0172F or 2.75 ZJ. Theoretically, room temperature computer memory operating at the Landauer limit could be changed at a rate of 1 billion bits per second with only 2.85 trillionths of a watt of power being expended in the memory media. Modern computers use millions of times as much energy. Landauer's principle can be understood to be a simple logical consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, which states that the entropy of an isolated system cannot decrease. together with the definition of thermodynamic temperature for if the number of possible logical states of a computation were to decrease as the computation proceeded forward logical irreversibility this would constitute a forbidden decrease of entropy unless the number of possible physical states corresponding to each logical state were to simultaneously increase by at least a compensating amount so that the total number of possible physical states was no smaller than originally total entropy has not decreased yet an increase in the number of physical states corresponding to each logical state means that for an observer who is keeping track of the logical state of the system but not the physical state for example an observer consisting of the computer itself the number of possible physical states has increased in other words Entropy has increased from the point of view of this observer. The maximum entropy of a bounded physical system is finite. If the holographic principle is correct, 
Then physical systems with finite surface area have a finite maximum entropy. But regardless of the truth of the holographic principle, quantum field theory dictates that the entropy of systems with finite radius and energy is finite. To avoid reaching this maximum over the course of an extended computation, entropy must eventually be expelled to an outside environment. The principle is widely accepted as physical law. But in recent years it has been challenged, notably in Ehrman and Norton 1998, and subsequently in Schenker 2000 and Norton 2004, 2011, and defended by Bennett 2003 and Lady Man et al. Now we discuss about classical information encoded in classical system. Here an example of decision tree. Two binary choices have to be made to identify the shape, triangle or square, and orientation, horizontal or rotated. In sending with equal probability one of the four objects, one therefore transmits two bits of information. And then imagine that you are holding an object B. It an array of cards, geometric shapes, or a complex molecule. And we ask the following question What is the information content of this object? To answer this question, we introduce another party say a friend who shares some background knowledge with us for example the same language or other sets of period arrangements that make communication possible at all but who does not know the state of the object we define the information content of the object as the size of the set of instruction that our friend requires to be able to reconstruct the object or better the state of the object. For example, assume that the object is a sign of particle and that we share with the friend the background knowledge that the spin is orientated either upward or downward along the direction with equal probability in this case the only instruction we need to transmit to another party to let him recreate the state is whether the state is spin up and spin down this example shows that in some case the instruction transmitted to our friend is just a choice between two alternatives more generally we can reduce a complicated set of instructions to n binary choices if that is done we really get a measure of the information content of the object by simply containing the number of binary choices in classical information theory a variable which can assume only the values 0 or 1 is called bit instruction to make a binary choices can be given by transmitting one to suggest one of the alternative say arrow upward and zero for the other arrow downward to sum up we say that n bits of information can be encoded in system voice instructions in the form of n binary choices need to be 
transmitted to identify or recreate the state of the system. Now we discuss about the Maxwell demands. We present a simplified version of the Maxwell's demand paradox suggested by Leo Cizillard in 1929. It employs an intelligent being or a computer of microscopic size operating a heat engine with a single molecule working fluid. In this key, the molecule is originally placed in a box free to move in the entire volume V. The next step is B consists of inserting a partition which divides the box into two equal parts. At this point, the Maxwell demand measures in which side of the box the molecule is and records the result in the peak molecule is pictured on the clockwise side of the partition as an example the next step c the maxwell demon uses the information to replace the partition with a piston and couple the latter to a load the next step d the one molecule gas is put in contact with the reservoir and expands isothermically to the original volume B. During the expansion, the gas draws heat from the reservoir and does work to lift the load. Apparently, the device is returned to its initial state and it's the ready to perform another cycle whose net result is again full conversion of heat into work, a process forbidden by the second law of thermodynamics. Let's talk about a thought experiment. Maxwell's demons, they huddled together for warmth. Now, let's say we took two different gases at different temperatures, one that's incredibly hot, where all of the particles are moving incredibly quickly, and another that's kind of cool where the particles maybe aren't moving around so quickly. They're kind of sluggish. They don't really want to move around. And let's say we put both of these types of particles in a box together so that they kind of interact with each other. Well, in this case, the two different temperature gases will reach what we call an equilibrium, where the temperature will be somewhere in between the temperature of the two other gases. And as physicists, we cannot stop this from happening. It just will always happen. But is there any way to maybe split up these two temperatures again? So if we take some sort of distribution, some sort of equilibrium where we're at some stable temperature, can we maybe split all of the faster particles to go one way and all of the colder particles to go another? Well, no, we can't. But if we could, we would be implementing what is known as Maxwell's demon. Essentially, imagine a giant rectangular prism with some sort of partition in the middle that means nothing at the start of the simulation. If we put two different types of gases in there, one that's hot and one that's cold, the two gases will form an equilibrium, like we said before, and they'll kind of intermingle and do their thing. But let's say at some point we decide that this partition should do something, right? The partition should force all of the hot particles to go to one side and all of the cold particles to go to another by simply saying you're not allowed to pass through me, the partition, unless you're moving at a particular speed. And in this way we've separated the hot and cold gases and made what is essentially an oven and a refrigerator in one. The entity that is physically separating the two gases was thought by Maxwell to be some sort of demon and hence the name Maxwell's D. Two different colored balls, let's say red balls and blue balls, and they're in two different boxes. And then we kind of put the two boxes together and shake up the box as fast as we can. The red and blue balls will kind of mix together, right? This is the second law of thermodynamics. It states that no matter how ordered a system is, when we evolve it thermodynamically, 
it will become more chaotic than it was before. The second law highlights an interesting thermodynamic principle, irreversibility. Basically, once things are shaken up, they don't often become unshaken. And it is for this reason that time must move in one direction, forward. And it is also for this reason that Maxwell's demon is one of the coolest physical thought experiments. Because it's not a matter of throwing cold particles to one side of the box and hot particles to another side of the box. It's a matter of reversing the irreversible, taking an arrow of time and flipping it on its head. And Maxwell's demon is one of the many reasons why I think physics is absolutely awesome. Anyway, thanks guys so much for watching and I will see you next time. Toodles.